and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thanks for, for joining us in what we hope will be a, a useful uh, session and give you some useful information and insights that might help now and into the future. Um, I might start by just introducing myself and talking a little bit about who Genesis is so you know um, who's presenting to you. So um, I'm a consulting director with Genesis. We're a relatively small consultancy practice uh, based in Dublin, but we, we work both uh, across uh, Ireland and internationally. Um, probably most relevant, we do a lot of work in the area of tourism and a lot of our work is advisory work in terms of uh, market strategies, uh, brand development um, and uh, communications is largely where we, we do a lot of work. We have a long track record of working with uh, TNI. We've done a good bit of work with the guys in TNI, but we've also worked with Tourism Ireland, um, a lot of work with Tourism Ireland, Falcher Ireland, uh, some industry work as well. And um, we've worked with ITIC. So um, we've a good long experience of working across different markets, both on domestic markets and international markets. Um, probably more um, importantly and more specifically in the context of today, uh, over the last number of years, we've done two important pieces of work in partnership with TNI. Um, uh, a number of years ago, probably three years now, I'd imagine at, at, at this time, we uh, undertook a um, review of the ROI market. Uh, which at the time we commenced the work uh, was suffering it in decline. There was a recovery, uh, tourism recovery task force put in place and we were charged by that task force to look at the ROI market and put a strategy for growth in place. And we were fortunate enough that during the course of the work, we won't take the credit, but during the course of the work, uh, the market turned. But hopefully the strategy that was put in place uh, then helped to sustain that turnaround and there was very there has been very good growth out of the oil market in, in recent years um, then last year what we were asked to do um, was to lead out in the project that looks at the domestic market which is going to be in a focus uh, for today and the thinking behind that was was that from northern ireland's perspective it had good clarity with respect to international markets and obviously that's work it does in partnership with tourism ireland but the international profile was well understood and there's uh, the strategy was well established and things were moving well on the international front and it had also taken the time to look specifically at the GB market so there was good clarity around that and as I said we'd done the work in the ROI market and there had been work done in the domestic market and um, so resident residents within Northern Ireland traveling within Northern Ireland and um, but it was uh, probably by their own admission outdated and needed to be updated uh, and it was recognized as a very important dimension of the market and it often uh, could be considered part of the backbone of the market. I mean, if the domestic market walks away or it dissipates, it, it creates a very significant problem. So we were retained to do a piece of work that would look at how to drive growth, sustainable growth in the domestic market. And that's uh, predominantly what I'm going to be sharing with you um, today. Um, as luck or bad luck would have it, um, that work is probably now more important than ever, given um, from a hospitality perspective, uh, our markets have shrunk in the near term. And the uh, obviously the emphasis now will be on domestic travel and ROI travel, because at least in the short term, that's probably all that we can really be facilitated, albeit probably that will hopefully change uh, next year. And we know that there's a uh, Obviously, people continue to move and look at international markets and that, that, that business will come back. But as I say, um, in the near term and then obviously probably into the future as well, domestic market hugely important. So that's what we're going to uh, emphasize looking at. Today. So the purpose of this webinar, and as Karen has sort of said, it's, it's one of three, is to really give you an overview and a sense of domestic tourism uh, strategy, uh, generally speaking, and in the context of here and now. And within that, what we're going to spend quite a lot of time is understanding the uh, key segments or consumers that exist within the market. So I think we would always advocate, and I think in hospitality is critical that we remain consumer and customer centric, understand their needs, their wants, their motivations, and then configure our product, our offering, our experiences and our communications in line with that. So one of the key themes or focuses for us today will be to understand the, the consumer and the market segments in some detail because they do provide the platform for us to take action that can hopefully drive consideration uh, in the context of uh, from Anoma and District Council, Council and those within that within that jurisdiction uh, action and then drive consideration and ultimately uh, choice and drive business. And um, we're going to ask some questions at the end 
uh, appreciating some of the limitations of the webinar, but we'll get through that. And what we'd say is if the questions aren't dealt with, we'll log them in the in the chat bot of the, uh, the conversation area and we can come back to them, if not today, in due course. And then we'll finish up by talking about the next steps. Again, from a process point of view, I'm going to do a bit of talking at the front end, then we can open it up at the back end for specific questions. So as I say, we're going to cover quite a bit of material. So if you've got a pen and paper, that's probably a good thing to have beside you so you can jot down a couple of questions or perspectives so they're not lost and we can surface them uh, towards the back end of the session. So let's spend a little time on the context, really important. And this was the importance of the domestic market pre-COVID. So it's hard to remember time before COVID, but there was, and it wasn't that long ago. And if we look back to probably the robust stats of it's a while ago, 2018, but it gives you a sense of what the domestic market represented that, at that time. So very, very significant in terms of volume, in terms of overnight trips at 44%. Now, as you'd expect, they, they did the index on spend decreases slightly uh, or somewhat because obviously, you know, international travelers, the travelers tend to spend more money. And if you're traveling from, say, the Republic of Ireland, you tend to spend more nights um, so and then create more value. But but still a third of the spend and any business where a third of the spend is, is either uh, sustained or developed is really, really strong. But again, if it goes away, it's a big problem. So it is a very important dimension to it. Um, 2.2 million trips and 300 million in revenue is the estimated expenditure and number of overnight trips. So a very, very significant volume. And one of the things that we would say about the domestic market, <clears throat> and we've done you know, a lot of work in tourism ourselves, is that we'd always say that the domestic market is actually key to the market itself. Because if the domestic market performs, it gives industry and the whole sector itself a platform to develop and grow and enhance its offering. Um, and also it, it get, tends to lead to a more authentic offering. So we may have on our own holidays and vacations been to places where there's very little domestic tourism um, and it's really built and delivered for international visitors only. And I think I'm it's sorry, so Connor, I'm going to interrupt you there. I don't think the presentation is playing for people. So oh, really? uh, if you just want to read. Um, let me try and sorry if there's a few yeah. comments here. Yeah. OK, let me go again here. Thanks for flagging that, folks. We'll Okay. Yeah. Are we are we good now? Yeah. Okay, I'll perfect. I now have a red box around my screen, which I think is a bit more that's, promising. That's it, okay. that's perfect now. Well, Thank I, you. Just, just <laughs> me. So sorry. Numbers there. Yes, I see some of the numbers I was talking about. And I was just saying that generally when the domestic market performs, it is always a, a key driver to broader performance because it allows a base for development, but also um it tends to lead to tourism experiences that are more authentic. So we all know there's nothing quite like being in a destination where the people of the destination are, pure, are, are clearly enjoying it, proud of it and active. Uh, so that's really, really important. And I think probably again, perhaps even more importantly again, is the domestic market is critical in terms of regional spread of tourism um, and the distribution. Really, really important. I think for, for Manoma, that's obviously a key consideration and a factor to be considered. And also for seasonal, I mean, it's a 20, 12 month calendar and yes, you're going to, we're going to have our peaks and our troughs, but again, a healthy domestic market helps to smooth over those peaks and troughs and makes the business year round sustainable. And we all know if we can have decent um, low, low season and strong high season, that's a good business equation for profitability and commercial success. That's always very, very important. So before our world changed, um, as we all know, it changed. Obviously, it was the domestic market was critically important, and for obvious reasons, it's going to be really important going forward. So it isn't forever, but certainly, I think it's fair to make the assumption or the assertion that in the uh, near term, at least, it's the ROI market and the domestic market that are going to be the mainstay of the market, and where the volume and the value can be extracted and developed. And therefore, uh, it's important to really, for I think, for industry now to be have a deep understanding of the domestic market and configure and gear itself to deliver uh, in line with their expectations uh, and above and beyond their expectations in order to drive business. But I think the other important thing to say is in this period, I think what we've heard anecdotally is there's a lot more people both within the Republic of Ireland and in Northern Ireland that are taking or have taken breaks uh, on the island that in the past wouldn't have done so. And in large part, they have been surprised and very pleased by what they've discovered. And therefore now is an opportunity to um, influence people maybe into the future to really strengthen and copper fast and grow the domestic market and the ROI market. So 
it's near term, but it is an opportunity as much as anything else, is what we'd say. Some of the key macro conditions we bring out in terms of the Northern Ireland domestic market. Some things to bear in mind that's coming at us. When you look at the key uh, demographic shifts is one thing. And I know it's well kind of said, but it's worth noting that we are looking at a very significant shift in population profile. So there'll be 25% growth in the number of people over 65 years of age in the next 10 years. And that may be important in terms of thinking about what experiences are offered, but also the type of value that might be available in the market. Um, obviously, older consumers tend often to have a uh, greater uh, spend uh, and be somewhat more affluent. So there's a real opportunity within that. Um, so just to bear that in mind. Um, we don't know economically, we have some sense of what will happen, but it's unknown. So post COVID, we don't know what we like, uh, pending recession, real implications of re Brexit. But all we could say is it, it is probably more likely than not to lead to a bias towards domestic breaks. And again, therefore, it's another reason or a motivation to understand the market and be well, um, well positioned to serve it. And when we think about competition, again, at least in the near term, it is likely to intensify. So they're probably from an ROI and a GP perspective, they may be more inclined to fish in the Northern Ireland market than ever before, particularly the ROI, which is particularly strong. And we know Fault Ireland is increasing its advertising, its capital expenditure. So there is a little bit of also defense as well as opportunity here as well within 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 the market. Uh, so now's the time to win. So now's the time to focus on the market itself. Having said all of that, uh, a really positive thing that we learned through all of the work was that the Northern Ireland brand is strong. So in the domestic market, uh, Northern Ireland as a destination is well thought of. It's seen as positively as the Republic of Ireland and in many strands stronger than uh, Great Britain. So it has a very good base uh, to build upon um, and large part by people are well disposed. But there is a job of um, informing, driving knowledge, driving awareness and convincing and really breaking any level of inertia that might exist around about the idea of taking a domestic break. Uh, but there's an opportunity to do that. And one of the key pieces that can potentially be leveraged uh, is value for money. So certainly as a key image driver of Northern Ireland versus the Republic of Ireland in particular, but also versus Great Britain, uh, was seen to have better uh, um, better value for money credentials, which again could be could be built on. Okay. Right, Karen, I'm getting a message that some people are in the lobby. I don't know if people are trying to get in, so um, I might just let them in from your side. So we're gonna, in this section now, we're going to look at some of the key information on the domestic market uh, at, a, at a high level, um, some of which you'll kind of know, I think. But again, it's very useful to put these facts and figures in place. They put everything in context. Uh, and this is when we did the work, it was pre-COVID, it was probably Q2 of, of, of last year that we did this work. But again, it's worth bearing in mind. So the first thing is just think about the market at large and why are they taking breaks? What's their motivation? And really, when we look at this, there's uh, two key tiers that exist within it. You can see on the far um, left hand side, time out is a big thing. So escape from routine, a change of scene, all that sort of bit. So people need to relax in their mind. And even though people probably haven't been able to move around, they might even be working from home. What we'd say is in, in, in these times, time out from that routine is probably even more important because the truth of it is, and we know this from talking to consumers, people have less diversity now in their lives than they ever did before. Groundhog Day is a real reality. So as and when the market can open back up, we would suspect there's going to be latent demand and significant potential uh, in, within the market itself. So just that idea of the change of scene away from the, the routine has always been important, but it could be really, really important now. The other interesting dimension is, is that's a huge driver around about short breaks or, or, or holidays as a means to build relationships. And again, that won't be any surprise, you know, whether it be a couple or a family or friends or whatever it might be. It's always been a key pillar. But again, it's worth reminding ourselves of the importance of it. I think from an industry point of view, the more you can provide environments and uh, platforms in which people can build relationships and have good times together and build memories together is really, really important. And interestingly, I think as well, you know, you could say, you know, we're, we're not meant to be around many, many people these days, but actually, if you think about it ironically, a lot of people have to connect with and build relationships, as I say, whether it be a couple or a family, getting out of the routine, getting get being together and having a platform which you can have a good time together and strengthen your relationships is very, very important. 
So there's two, those key timeless kind of drivers and motivations remain true. Uh, and what we'd say they're probably even more accentuated now uh, in terms of in terms of the pandemic. And there is a real opportunity to leverage these both in comms and experience in offers and itineraries at the center of that. This idea of time out and build relationships may be opportunistic to, to have a look at that. So it's a, it's 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 not a re, it's not a, a revelation, but again, it's an important dimension for us to consider. The other bit is is to really think about, you know, what are people interested in? But then alongside that, why do people travel? And we found here from a domestic point of view, there's very strong alignment between what I'm interested in and what I'm why I would travel. So there's no major um, there's no major surprise there. But it's interesting to see the relative rating. So uh, in particular, it's very interesting to see that food and drink comes out so high. Um, so again, in terms of any propositions or products or experiences, uh, you know, high quality or good food and drink experiences remains very, very important. And what we'd also say is the quality of uh, food offering, the quality of the drink offering, food in particular, is now somewhat a bit of a proxy for the quality of a destination. So a accommodation provider or a attraction or a area that is seen to have very, very strong food credentials by default is seen to have very good tourism credentials. So again, you'll know this, but again, it affirms that shopping for some is important. Uh, you know, people enjoy that one on their breaks, maybe less so able to do it now. But then the other interesting thing is you look in the tier that the experience rooted in outdoors comes through very, very strongly and people's uh, desire to be out in the outdoors and enjoying fresh air and activities, whether they be soft or a little bit more uh, active activities. And I think this obviously plays into uh, a lot of the what industry within the, uh, the council area uh, has strengths in already. So and it also obviously plays into uh, people's concerns around about, you know, being healthy, being safe and being outdoors, uh, particularly in the context of the pandemic. So all this stuff is there. But again, it's really about what triggers do we need to pull in our experience, in our comms and in our approach to the market that we know will land and know will resonate uh, with the consumers. So again, it's just affirming that and then understanding the prioritization of that. And it's not to say that any one dimension will help us win. Often it's the convergence of the dimensions. So it's a fantastic food offering with a fantastic uh, outdoor offering and environmental offering becomes very, very important. And we'll see how that becomes important when we look at the market itself, this segmentation market itself. In terms of where people are going, again, probably no major surprises in it, but we can go to some specifics out here. And this is their kind of last break taken when we looked at the domestic market. So you can see the penetration of where people are going here in the top uh, left hand corner. So city of Belfast uh, comes out high, but the highest is uh, the Cause Causeway Coast and Glen. So still a huge amount of domestic market going there. But it's interesting to see Fermanagh Lakes at, at 35 percent. So it's a high volume from a domestic market point of view, a good base. So you can push on from there. And I know within the area, you know, part of the sparing is included. But again, you can see the relativity at nine percent. And again, it's about how do we grow? The question is, how do we grow that as, a, as an overall offering? The type of breaks, family holiday breaks, still very, very, very key within that. And romantic breaks, very, very important. And then you can see the other dimensions that are sit at sit at sit below that. But really, this family holiday break and romantic break are seem to be important. So the family unit and the couple unit, very, very important. And that's mirrored with whom? So spouse or partner and children coming through there and a preference uh, for a hotel. We can see that the average spend is up to 400. Yes, yeah, so it's a healthy enough spend um, because if we look at the number of nights, it really spans the, the, the majority is two to three nights. So the spend c corresponds with that. So the economic value seems to be there. Most 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 instances is two people and the type of hotel. There are three or four star hotels being entertained. And then what we see here on the restaurant type is a good enough distribution across different uh, types of restaurant restaurant types and offerings um, that people prefer. And again, this is probably no surprise it, because when we consider the importance of food and drink, you can see that the uh, restaurant type has good penetration across a number of different factors within that. So it gives us a flavor at a high level of where people are going, who they're with, what they're doing, what they're spending, how long they're spending and all these sorts of things within this. Perhaps more importantly or interestingly is we look at people's level of familiarity. So uh, we would posit the view that it's very hard to go somewhere if you feel that you don't know it at all. So some level of familiarity is very, very important. So if you start to look at the destinations in terms of familiarity ratings, you can see that people tend to feel they have a good enough familiarity with Northern Ireland as a, as a holiday destination. But you can see where that knowledge lies. 
And again, specifically for uh, this industry, uh, you can see the Fermanagh Lakes is at 56% and uh, County Tyrone and Sperrins is at 32%. And you can choose to look at the glass being half empty or half full. So I would say, or our, our view would be 56% of familiarity is good, uh, but there's 44% there by default who are saying they don't have great familiarity, which represents an opportunity, uh, particularly for Fermanagh, but also for uh, Sperrins as well at 32 with the balance uh, there being you know, at 58% lack of familiarity. So the job of drawing, drawing knowledge uh, and awareness of destinations and then their appeal, it will always be there, but we can see the relativity of how familiar people are uh, with different destinations within Northern Ireland. Uh, and then we can set aspirations of growing familiarity and awareness and knowledge, because these are obviously what generally precedes consideration and then choice. And again, what we can look at here at a general level is um, where people are have planning, where they're interested. And again, you can see that you know, a lot of planning resides into the city of Belfast, and you can see the Causeway Coast and Glens comes in there as well. But it slightly falls off from the lakes at 23. But what's probably perhaps more interesting is if you look at the interested at some stage in the future. So if you look at from the lakes, that's at 31. And then you look at the Tyrone and the Sperrins, that's at 28. And they are significant figures because they are what we would call our potential our potential. So I am interested. So they're open to it. So I would say that, you know, from 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 both from both the destinations defined within this, both from Anna Lakes and County Spar County Run and Sparrows, you could deduce that approximately one in three people people are interested in visiting a stage in the future. And that's a pretty large audience to try and connect with and drive consideration. Of, uh, of the destinations and then drive conversion. So there are some good metrics in here, but obviously you'd like to see them strengthened and you'd like to see the, the green bar, which is planning to visit in the next 12 months. So I'm actually absolutely going to do it, grow and grow and grow. Uh, so the question we have to ask ourselves is what work do we need to do in order to grow that? And that is the function of communications, but critically it's also a function of things about how we, how we configure our itineraries, uh, the value for money proposition we put in place and the quality of the experiences we deliver. So it's not just about paid for communication, it's all those other dimensions that will drive consideration and choice. Um, some other dynamics that are important in terms of, you know, attitude towards planning and booking. And one thing that came through really loud and clear from domestic market, and again, it won't surprise you, is the importance of online. So if you look at the highest rated statements, you know, four or five of the top six uh, are talking about online. So I do most of my short break research online. Google's my first port of call. I do a lot of research. I review ratings, online ratings, and I look for recommendations. So there's a good few things here that really push the importance of online and digital. And then obviously word of mouth is really important as well. But people do like to do their work to research and people do like to get recommendations. Uh, and online is a key platform for doing that. Interesting, if you look at then the bottom end where the, the statements that are uh, rated the lowest, it actually starts to lean towards more traditional advertising, whether it be TV, radio advertising. So those sort of traditional channels of communication seem to be dissipating, and it's online word of mouth and these sort of things that seem to be driving. And you can see here the balance in terms of the intermediated, um, the booking booking sites. Booking.com seems to be the predominant one, some presence of Airbnb, Travago, and Expedia. But again, the emergence of those, um, and I know they're part of the ecosystem now, but the importance of them can't be underestimated in terms of the domestic market and the, the, the propensity to go through someone like a booking.com rather than going direct to, it, it is pretty high. So again, in terms of actual channel strategy for uh, the sale uh, of uh, tourism uh, products and accommodation and experiences, very, very important. Okay, so that's an overview. We thought we'd just take the second chapter we thought we'd look at is saying, okay, that was that's great and all that was done uh that work was done before uh COVID, but things can, have changed um you know significantly now thankfully what we have here that we can supplement the work we've done already on the domestic market is quite a recent study into consumer sentiment that was conducted in september or completed in september 2020 of this year so only a couple of months ago and we are things are changing dynamically but there's very strong signposts in terms of how people are feeling now and the reason we think it's important to go through this is, is that if we start to have a fundamental understanding of domestic market at, based on some of the data we looked already, and we start to understand the mindset of some of the consumers now, and we can pair that up with a really deep consumer insight in terms of the segmentation, 
that might be a very good platform for us to make for industry or for individual operators to make decisions and take actions that are well focused and are more likely to drive value out of the market than not. So we'll have a look at some of them. I think the key findings here is, is that you no know, surprise there was kind of pessimism and fears of contracting the virus was widespread across consumer base, much like any market. It's hard to be uh, up to a certain extent or well back in September. Um, so that was significant. What was noted was an uneasiness for the indoor activities is high and obviously in the context of tourism that's very very important. Now I think um, within the Fermanagh Oma, Oma district you've got you know a, a richness of outdoor activities that can be leveraged so that can play into a particular strength um, on the other side of that. Um, safety messages are important so the reinsurance reassurance around about safety is important so it's almost it has almost become an additional strand of communications that didn't have to be there before but it is helpful now and what we're seeing here is is that what was specifically examined was the good to go mark was seen to start to emerge as providing reassurance um, and that kind of quality mark that gave a different dimension of reassurance to the consumer and that's you know, certainly seen starting to have traction and was important and I know on the ground um, that some of the operators have obviously embraced that and we think it's important that that is actually uh, pursued even further and delivered on even further. Um, we also know from the findings the consumer said that there's room to encourage more overnight stays so, um, they, so the demand is there um, and given the right conditions, certainly there's an opportunity to drive overnight stays in the domestic market, um, which is well needed and sought after now. Um, and you know, really, one of the things we said earlier, the last thing is that people are looking at staycations as a way of unwinding. I think now, um, more than ever, we all need a bit of a way to unwind, given our lives, we can get kind of locked down and limited what we can do. And as things open back up and we may be in cyclical, uh, a cyclical state about opening and sort of contracting a wee bit into the future until such as times vaccine is widespread there is an opportunity to say look it's time you need the break you need the space and there's no better place than you know for manor or over the district or the areas around that in order to do that so there is an opportunity to, to absolutely do that and drive value out of the domestic market some specifics when we go into them we talked about the importance of outdoor, outdoor activities and you'll see here interestingly that you know most studies uh, in terms of anxiety levels, people are less anxious about holidays in Northern Ireland. So that's it's a huge dimension within that. And there are other things if you look at, you know, outdoor attractions, uh, quite at the ease there as well. So you put those component parts together, um, then they start to tell a tell a story. Because you go to the other end of the spectrum, very people are very uneasy about holidays abroad. Um, there still is some unease around pubs and bars. So again, how we actually deliver the food and drink, whether it be pubs, bars, or restaurants, very, very important. Or being in crowded spaces with a bus commuting and that sort of stuff, unease around that. And again, this is kind of important in terms of how we think we can configure and communicate our overall offerings and what the experience is for people who do take uh, short breaks or or, or dead breaks in the domestic market. Um, we know that interestingly, safety and security has become a key consideration. If we had gone back 12 months, this really wouldn't have been there. But now we see uh, as a key driver um, our key consideration is safety security specifically related to COVID-19. So that's very important. And there are the things, then there are the things that were there before, accommodation costs, value for money, being attractions, good choice of accommodations, choice of place in the eat out. Uh, all these things are still there. But the important thing to note is, is that, you know, this, this sense of safety and security with respect to, to COVID-19 was prevalent at least in September and there's no reason to think it wouldn't be now. So again, reassurances around about that or taking the measures and being clear about communicating the measures and also implementing implementing the measures is really, really important. I know myself, um, as soon as we in uh, ROI came out of lockdown, I made as quickly as I possibly could. Uh, myself, my family made our way down to Dingle uh, for a week and it was very interesting. Um, you could see how uh, safety, le different levels of safety measures were being adopted uh, by different uh, operators. And I have to say, on a personal level, it was always very pleasing to see the ones that were very well organised and were very clear about the precautions that they were taking. Uh, it gave us a level of confidence and allowed us to enjoy our time away more. So I'd say it is very, very important and we kind of experienced that myself. Um, the other thing to note from it is, is that, you know, we've got one in four intending to take a short break. Um, so that's, you know, 25%. Hopefully there's a lot more to be had within that, but it makes the case that we've got to put the reason in front of them. 
So whatever demand is there, there may be a bit of inertia. Um, because we've had uncertainty in recent times, um, there's always a likelihood that uncertainty leads to inertia. So there may be a job of work in front of us, or in front of you, in terms of breaking inertia and putting noses as to why they should uh, take the break and why they should choose to go to uh, your area rather than anywhere else. Um, but again, you can see it as a challenge, you know, you can see it as a real opportunity, but it is there. So um, it's about addressing the market and uh, really convincing them or give them very good reason uh, to travel. OK, um, and one of the last things we'd say is, is that um, we mentioned earlier is, is that there was in September growing awareness of the we're good to go mark. Um, and for those who were aware of it, it was starting to inspire a level of confidence. Uh, even even you know gives me confidence at, in, and even at forty percent it gives me a lot and it gives me confidence and then a significant sway it gives me a little confidence and as as awareness and knowledge and understanding of that of that initiative grows it can only drive further further confidence which again might be a, a key element in driving choice in breaking inertia um, and really securing business from the domestic market so we said it's a good initiative that needs to be followed through and developed further. Uh, because it is probably going to be important in terms of uh, driving performance in the future. Okay. So um, we've covered off a couple of things. Um, we've done the context and um, we've taken a look at um, the domestic market at, at a high level. We've had a look at the um, sentiment currently. So we're starting to layer in the information, hopefully in a useful way. Um, the real question now is if we are going to go for growth, what is the advised strategy? Or what was what is the strategy that was established with respect to the domestic market? So we're going to have a look at that, and in particular, we're going to deep dive around a bit the segments to give a bit of familiarity. Again, these targets were set uh, before uh, the pandemic, but there was an ambition for growth at about you know up to, for ten years at twenty four percent growth in, in trips, thirty one percent growth in spend. I'd say if we reviewed these now, there would be significantly higher than we did that than this now, and there really is a, a need and a want to drive significant growth. Um, but these are rel and these are relatively conservative figures. If you look at the per annum growth, it's certainly there to be had uh, when normal market conditions return. Um, so there is an opportunity to drive that sort of growth. And I think the one thing to say about this as well is, is that it tends to be more dependable growth than any other. So international markets, although there was a significant bounce, they can come and go. They do rise and they do fall, where the domestic market is much more steady state. Um, and for any business, I think the steady state uh, run line, that baseline of business is hugely important. So again, uh, driving growth and a foundation for growth in the domestic market will continue to be a very, very important uh, element within that. And then if we touch on the strategy itself, uh, it, um, four key pillars emerged in the strategy. Uh, and again, these may not be um, you know, too surprising. It is to a certain degree doing the fundamentals well, uh, in fact, doing them brilliantly. And what we learned through the strategy was what needs to be driven here. And as I say, uh, what I'd say is that we'll share the link within the document toward the full strategy you can read into it, is effective communications are really, really important in terms of driving performance. We can't assume that there is knowledge and awareness of what uh, the domestic market has to offer, the offer that exists with the Vermana and Oma and, and the surrounding areas. Uh, in fact, we're probably better served assuming the opposite, that there is uh, not enough awareness and knowledge currently and the more because I think there's quite a quite a, um, a salient and compelling offering from uh, the area uh, of which you, ex you reside uh, the more we can drive awareness and knowledge through effective communications the better but there is a big need to do that but alongside that it's not just about communications it's about the substance that sits behind them so communicating is one thing delivering is another so really the development of, co of compelling experiences and attractions events is, is hugely important within this it's the substance it's where the rubber hits the road so again the more that we can understand what the consumer wants and needs and configure our experiences in an authentic way that delivers on their requirements the better and then there are two other dimensions there's obviously the stakeholder engagement this is about you know really a well-informed and a well galvanized industry, but it's also a collaboration on an industry level and not one operator really wanting to succeed in his or her own right and probably taking the collective view. Uh, so there is that whole piece around about how the industry can collaborate together, how it can work really effectively with T&I and any other bodies, community groups or otherwise, um, attraction owners, uh, people who are running festivals and want to run events, that how they converge and come together. 
in order to really make a destination very, very compelling and interesting uh, is really important. So the more that can be fostered. And the last piece is, is citizen and community engagement and advocacy. So again, we touched on this very early, but the truth of it is, the more that people of the area are proud of the area, of are motivated by the area and choose to take recreation activities in the area, the better, you know? And this is about, you know, the offer within the particular area being really strong, so strong that people of that community uh, engage in it, uh, talk about it, promote it and are advocates for it. Uh, so that's hugely, hugely important. But also it's about the delivery of the experiences. So the more that there is people who would volunteer to support, um, you know, tourism experiences or, involve, or, or, or engage in the delivery of them, the better. So we always see that in really good tourism destinations is that people of the destination have heart for them, are active in them and love for them to be delivered to the highest standard. So there's real gain by having a strategic view around about citizen and community engagement as well. Okay. Sorry, what I would say on that is, is that, you know, that the, the future webinars in this series are going to, are going to, are going to zone in the top two as well. So um, we're doing an overview today, but the follow up, follow up workshops or webinars will be focusing on those. So two really valuable strategic areas will be co covered uh, in due course. So what we're going to look at now is the actual uh, how we segment the market. So let me introduce to you kind of the, the, the six segments that exist. So we did this on a quantitative basis. So it's like fully kind of scientific and technical approach to looking at the market. So when we looked at the market, um, and we did it, we did our kind of research work and then we did our analysis work. What emerged was six clear distinct segments uh, within the marketplace and I'll walk you through who they are. OK, so so the first segment is called the comfort seekers at 13 percent. And I'll go into these in a little bit more detail. Then we had the pragmatists at 13 percent. We had a big family segment of the aspiring families at 30 percent. We had a segment that we were described as a short period enthusiast at 14. We had another segment, the natural quality seekers at 15, and then we had a younger segment, the social Instagram is at 15%. So let us, let's just talk a little bit about, about those segments now to give you a little bit of a feel for them, okay? So if we look at the comfort seekers, 13% um, of the market, and what they're most likely to say is, you, you know, I know, what, I know, I know what I like, um, and I like what I know, is essentially what they say. These are creatures of habit. They don't look for things that are different. They tend to find what they like on a domestic basis and go there repeatedly, okay? So you might have a lot of these um, segments or consumers already, repeat visitors. And as long as you mind them, um, then you're, you're likely to get them back because they, do, they don't want to go further afield. And that's a double-edged sword because they become a very difficult segment to attract, but they become an easier segment to retain. So what you've got, you've got. The only thing I'd say alongside this is the economic profile and value of this segment is pretty low. So if you had a choice of adding segments or adding consumers, this is probably not the segment you'd fish in because they don't have the biggest spend relative to others. So they're hard to persuade to come. They don't have the biggest spend, but if you have them, you can retain them. So that's the comfort seekers. Then you got the pragmatists. And what defined this segment was that they were, was as, as it's described, very pragmatic about the decisions. They're most, most likely to say breaks are important, but you have to be sensible to your decisions. So this kind of group represented a very prudent um, bunch of consumers who weighed the pros and cons of what a destination offered relative to the value for money that it offered, relative to the ease of access and a lot of pragmatic dimensions associated with that as well. OK, again, these people are very careful with their money and uh, they have money, but they're very careful, careful with it um, and they make or at least they feel they make very good decisions with it. And potentially the opportunity here, here, here is they'll respond very well to good offers. OK, so again, understanding and configuring a very pragmatic offer that it is good value with, you know, a good food offering, good accommodation offering and reasonable experience around that kind of resonates with them. So they're not looking for the massively compelling. They're not looking for the mass, mass, massively differentiated offering. What they're looking for is good value for money, all the basics that you'd expect and a very reliable experience within that. And there's a place for those within the market. It may not be the one that we'd aspire to deliver on because it won't drive us to really innovate or put forward, you know, radically different experiences, but they are, but they are a segment that exists nonetheless. Okay. Then we have a very large segment of inspiring families, but also a very high value segment. So, so they tend to be a little bit more affluent, but more importantly, when they do travel, they spend quite a bit of money because they have got a lot of outgoings in terms of the family and the, and the kids and accommodation and all that. 
Now, we'll characterize them and what they're most likely to say. It's all about connecting with the kids, proper family time and experiences. So what's very important to bear in mind, and we'll talk about the second in more detail, is, is what they want when they are on their trips is a platform to have enriched experiences with their families and connect with their with their children on a different level than they do maybe in the in, in their general run of things. Um, so again, that is an insight into that particular segment is important. If you do aspire to attract the family segment, understanding what makes them tick is really, really important. Um, the next segment is called the short break enthusiasts. And what they're most likely to say is I'm passionate about travel. There is so much to experience. This is a very interesting segment because when we discovered the segment through the work, we thought these would be a really important segment to address within the domestic market. But actually what we found here is, is that this segment had a very low propensity to take domestic breaks. And the reason being was their whole aspiration and ambition was to go places they hadn't been before and see things they hadn't seen before. So their overseas travel, whether it be for weekends or for longer breaks, was much, much higher than any other segments. And they were much less motivated by the idea of a domestic break. Now, that might change in the near term because they may be very frustrated now and have no choice. But as a long term strategy, it's very difficult to convince this segment. Uh, the fifth segment is the natural quality seeker, the 15 percent. Uh, an older segment and a very affluent segment. And what they're likely to say is there's nothing better than staying in a beautiful place, being surrounded by beauty. So what these guys are very motivated by, and we'll talk about it in more detail, is keying in on great accommodation in a great environment where they can enjoy the outdoors and enjoy the outdoors. But they also have a very strong environmental uh, dimension to them. So they are interested in sustainability and the protection of, of, of the, both the natural and built environment. So again, that's an important consideration for them. But we'll talk about those in a little bit of detail. And then we have a younger cohort, a younger segment. So uh, social Instagram is at 50%. So they're all about you got to get out there and see what's happening, get to the heart and buzz of it. So likely to be more, but not always engaged in more urban destinations, but all want experiences, what jam packed days, want new experiences, different food, different experiences, socialization, all these sorts of things that you would expect to find in the younger segment are present within them. But again, we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. So if we have those six segments, then becomes the next question is, do I target all of them or what are the most important ones? And at least on a kind of a whole market scale, um, what we did to determine what, what, what were the priority segments, we looked at a couple of dimensions. And the first, thing, the first couple, of things, the couple of things we looked at is we asked ourselves some questions. So is the segment of scale? Is it sizable? Is the first question. The second question is, do they spend money? Do they have value? OK. And the third question was, are they positive towards Northern Ireland now or likely to be in the future? OK, because the magic equation that we're looking at here is, is to find the segments that were of significant or adequate size that had a good economic profile and could contrib contribute value, but also were well disposed to Northern Ireland as a destination already because that targeting those was probably going to increase or was the best uh, equation to find segments that we could actually attract, convert and extract value from. Because if you go to the other side of the equation, if you find segments that aren't that big in scale, don't have a good economic profile and aren't really considering Northern Ireland already, why would you pursue them? It seems like a very hard task to pursue them. So we looked at all that and modeled all that out and we determined the three priority segments. And to say this, you know, this is at, at, at a high level, you may be sitting there and thinking about, well, actually, there's only one for me, and that's absolutely fine. It's just three in broad terms, or there may be two for me. So, so that's so as we know it. And what came out there in terms of priority of the segments were the natural quality seekers, the aspiring families, and social Instagrammers. They all had the aspiring families of three percent, very large in scale. The others had had, had had sufficient scale. They all had relatively good economic profiles, and they all were relatively well disposed, or different to a certain degrees, but relatively well disposed. Um, in terms of um, the Northern Ireland's destination already. So let's let's unpack them in a little bit more detail now. So if we look at the natural quality seekers, so what we see within um, this segment, and these may be very important in the context of, uh, of the, uh, the Fermanagh or Omer District Council region and area, is what they're looking for is quality accommodation, really, really important. So be assured of that, okay? And then paired with that is they are nature lovers and they enjoy the outdoors. So the idea of being able to stay somewhere nice, but then being able to enjoy the natural environment uh, and natural landscape, flora, fauna, all these sorts of things, really, really important. Mm -hmm. And then what they want to do is not just enjoy that, but as they're enjoying it, engage in gentle activities. That's hill walking and walking and those sorts of dimensions attached to it. So again, it's not high octane stuff, 
but it is that simple stuff, those simple joys of being able to go out for really good long walks, enjoy the walks, gentle activities, to be in the environment uh, and possibly do a bit of learning while they're doing that. A fourth dimension is that sustainability is very, very important. Um, so again, the more that any uh, destination can develop up its, its environmental conditions and show that the environment is thought of, protected and respected, the more important or the more, the more higher in the esteem for this segment will go up. So this isn't just about kind of lip service, the environment is about really having, having good credentials within that. They enjoy planning and like to have clear itineraries. So again, this talks to the importance of if we're positioning your destination um, or your experience, what is it like? Attractions on right. What is it? What's around? What can the utilities look like? Because these this segment likes to know what it's going to do before it goes. So again, aiding and supporting them to have really clear plans, itineraries, and a sense of what they can do really, really important. And again, important. No, no surprise here. Short breaks are important part of their lives. So again, if you go back to some of the motivations between a timeout, building relationships, all those sorts of things, very, very important. They're older in terms of their profile, more likely to be a BBC one, have grown up kids. So they have the money, they have the time, they know what they want, and now it's really about, uh, going out and, you know, connecting with them and demonstrating that as a destination that you have what they want and you can deliver on it. Um, and they have a high annual spend. I think that's probably I don't know the date now. It's, I think it's out of the, it's certainly out of the first or second highest spend relative to all segments. Okay, that's the natural quality seekers. The second priority segment is aspiring families. Now, just by their size, they would become a priority segment. But I think, you know, families are obviously a mainstay of any domestic market and very, very important within that. So let's let's look at them. Actually, they, yeah, these are the highest spend as well. So very strong from family focus, which you've kind of talked about already. So it is about connect, connecting with your kids, having a real experience with them. And um, so, you know, whether it's, you know, you're, you're doing your school runs, you're doing all that sort of stuff. You're probably both parents are working on that sort of stuff. So you know, Northern Ireland is a destination on a domestic basis can step up and offer an opportunity to step away from that, to actually have real time with your children, real time with your partner, connect, enjoy, build memories and walk away with going, you know, we're, we're closer as a family unit now than we were before. And we have these experiences and memories that we didn't have before. And that's a very uh, potent, both emotional territory and practical territory, because these people are practical. They do, do a lot of planners and do a lot of research because they do not to go on, on a family break and find out that, uh oh, we didn't do our homework and now we don't have the things that we want to do. There's not much to do or it's not suitable for us as a family unit. So again, really, really important that. And it would link to that activities are very important, all types. They like to try things, like to do different, they have a variety of interests. So the more choice and diversity that's available for them in the context of the family unit, really, really important. If they have money, they will spend money, but they pay attention to price. This isn't about for them the cheapest. It's not about that at all. It's about value for money. So they don't mind paying a premium if the premium is deserved because spend the money, get a great experience, build great memories, have a great time. That's the equation for them. So again, there's value to be extracted, but you got to you really have to step up and deliver on the experiences. It won't surprise you that related to activities, they need to suit children um, as well as the family as a whole. That's worth considering active unit and what can be offer, offered. Um, and I mentioned that point around about they do hunt, so they feel like they're hunting for bargains, but they'll pay for something to feel they feel it's worth worth it. Demographics most likely kind of early family stage, 30 to 45, even social class split, split, and obviously much more likely to have younger children. But again, they're the biggest spenders within the domestic market. So again, a lot of value to be had uh, within that. Okay. So now we'll move on to the third priority segment, the social Instagrammers. So what we see within these 15% of the market, a lower spend, but still a significant enough spend. Very much into the buzz and atmosphere, want excitement, want uh, more energy. They see short breaks as a really important part of their life. And linked to that, obviously, the, the atmosphere is, is that you're seeking night like great pubs um, and, and be able to interact with people. And that's obviously put in the back burner for now. But as things start to turn, turn a corner, they become in very uh, prevalent again. Also, interestingly, they want to broaden the mind. So it's not just all about the nightlife and uh, drinks and socialization. It's about discovering new places, seeing new things and learning new things. They have an appetite for learning and have an appetite for different experiences. They are more likely to use use Airbnb, Airbnb as, you, as you'd expect the over index on that. But some of the other things as well is, is that connectivity is very important. And so, you know, by the nature of their, their digital natives and therefore Wi-Fi, 4G, connectivity, 5G, all very, very important. So again, in terms of product offering and some of the fundamentals, whether Wi-Fi availability or, or speed within establishments, very, very important. Um, they're focused on getting a good deal, but unlike other segments, 
they'll put the money they spend on activities ahead of accommodation. Now they want to stay in relatively decent accommodation. But the real question is if it's you know it's a good price and it's clean and it's, and, and it's in good shape. That's great for company. What are the activities around me? What can I do now when I leave the four walls of the room that I'm paying for? What do I do? What experiences can I have? From a demographic point of view, they're the youngest segments, you know, um, so they're you know anywhere from 18, 24, 25, 34 age. They're least likely to have children, obviously. Uh, they're more likely to be female as well, and they have a slight C2D but bias in terms of their their social pro their social class profile. But that that may clearly be linked to their their stage of their careers because uh, class is driven out as kind of how they state their careers, and they have an av- 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 estimated annual spend on a domestic holiday base of about a thousand uh, pounds. So there's value within that there. So that are the three segments. So that gives you a sense of the, the segment. So again, what we're trying to layer in here is an overview of the market, a sense of customer sentiment, a sense of the overall market strategy, and then a deep into the um, the actual segments themselves. And again, there's more information and available on these particular segments. Uh, the, the the actual strategy document is available, and I think T and I would be able to provide additional information as well. And if you go online, also there's little videos that talk about the segments or portray the segments as well, which may be valuable for you to view. So that's all resources that are there. One of the questions you might be asked is, say, okay, how does this all line up in terms of the Republic of Ireland market in the near term and internationally later? Well, look, you know, we've got lots of different segments and it's important to understand different nuances. But what we could say at a high level is, is if you look at the segments across international markets, ROI and the domestic market itself, there are kind of a couple of key themes that emerge. What we'd say here is, is that we have the nature and outdoors as a, as a big dimension. Culture and heritage is a big dimension and socializing and nightlife. Now, this last dimension, socializing and nightlife, mightn't be to the fore for the, the near future. So let's just park that for a moment. But the more that any destination can build its credentials in terms of the natural environment, nature and the outdoors, the better. That will work on an international level for great escapers, on an ROI level for active maximizers, if you're familiar with that segmentation, and um, on the domestic level, natural quality seekers. But it works for all segments, really. But that's really one thing we'd say there. And then there's culture and heritage. So that, again, talks to different needs of different segments within that. And the art here is to understand at a high level what's really important to the segments and respond to that. But then start to understand whether it be domestic market, for example, that market in a bit more granular detail. So you can fine tune your offering, fine tune your communications, fine tune the experiences that you're going to deliver. So you can have higher confidence around about the work and resources that you're applying in terms of your experience and your offering, that it will land and it will resonate with the particular segments that you want. And our sense would be is that while the, for the next foreseeable future, near future, while the domestic market is so important, now is an opportunity to really be intimate with that market and configure your communications and your offer in a way that will resonate with them. So you can have confidence over your investment and you can have some level of confidence over your likelihood of conversion and translating you know, all your efforts into real business and sustainable business. And then, of course, the other thing to say is, is that if we can attract the domestic market and they come and they experience what we have to offer and we delight them, well, then we've got a much bigger, better chance of repeat visitation and also driving word of mouth on a domestic level in terms of in dri- driving business uh, in a more sustainable way. OK, as a kind of reference, there's a detailed strategy available. There's a very tiny link down the bottom of this page, but this presentation will go to you and this can be easily found online as well. So if you do have the time, it's probably uh, a couple of cups of coffee worth. You can sit down, you can work your way through it, you can read it in some detail. And then obviously there's linkage with TNI in terms of supports around about helping and supporting you to activate uh, to really deliver within the within the domestic market. And to finish this little piece on a, on a, on a kind of up note, um, what we'd say is this too shall pass. So um, there is going to be a time in the near future where all markets are, are back in the game, uh, not just the ROI and not just the domestic market. But there is no, uh, what, what we'd say is, is that in the near term, there's loads of work that can be done for the domestic market, in particular in the ROI market, that actually will stretch strengthen our, our proposition on an international market basis and hopefully we can come out of this whole uh, period even stronger than we were before there's nothing quite like adversity or a burning platform to drive change and i think that it's very it's interesting to look at it and saying maybe maybe one of the platforms to drive change uh, and drive development is by doubling down and refocusing on the domestic market and extracting value from it so i'll um stop there um, and what i might do is i might stop presenting so I can see faces of anyone on camera. 
um, and we can open it up to any um, questions uh, that people have or discussions or contributions. Thank you, Connor. That's great. Um, yeah, I suppose, Tara, if you want to allow people to maybe um, ask questions, but we do have one um, in the in the chat box, Connor. Okay. Um, it's from Cormac. Um, I don't know if you have this information when you were doing the domestic strategy, and it's um, around. Obviously, you're quoting around um, COVID um, and anxiety in relation to that. And um, it's just wondering if the the history of conflict is still um, a consideration for people whenever they're considering visiting uh, Northern Ireland. Yeah. Well. Okay. So let me let me talk a little bit about that. Um, we 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 investigated that um quite in quite some detail when we did the work and we did it on what we'd say a qualitative basis so we did it kind of in face-to-face -face research rather than kind of online structured surveys and some really interesting things emerged within that we wouldn't say it's a particularly um overriding factor for consideration okay particularly with older age cohorts okay so what we learned when we had, say, research groups with the natural quality seekers, for example, is that by as a consequence of their age, they're 50 plus, 60 plus, they had grown up and had a very different experience um, growing up uh, of being a resident in Northern Ireland. So they look on this era now and look at the way Northern Ireland is now, and they think this is a fantastic, we've come so far. And therefore, the idea of them traveling somewhere on a domestic ba basis is completely open. And the idea of any past conflict is largely irrelevant to them. OK, so that's so that's one cohort. OK, the other thing is, is that from a the younger cohort or social Instagrammers, a lot of them don't have or didn't have the exposure to growing up in a time where there was um, unrest. So they don't remember it. Uh, and they didn't experience it. And therefore, it's not a limitation to them either. But the interesting thing is, is that doesn't say that they're inter they're not interested in it. OK, um, so, uh, so 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 this kind of post conflict tourism piece as well is something that can be, I think, handled carefully. But it is something that is of interest if people are looking for new experiences, looking to broaden their mind. It is there. I mean, I certainly know an international level that has traction. So we wouldn't say there's an issue there. The only thing that we would say is, is that there are, and this is more cultural than anything, there are little creases within society. So, you know, even ourselves, when we were doing uh, the research, um, you know, we did uh, qualitative research in Derry, Londonderry. And it's really interesting that you have to use the name when we were talking to people there. And they were saying, look, it's, they, were, they were all of Derry, Londonderry, and kind of thinking, we even ourselves, if I have to second guess how we introduce where we're from, depending who we're in front, so there are still those some cultural nuances are important. But certainly what we'd say is in the round, if you're asking the question in a kind of binary way, is the conflict of the past and the era of the trouble is going to prohibit domestic tourism? We would say resoundingly no. We'd say resoundingly no. And it's much, much more about the opportunity to discover parts of Northern Ireland that you do haven't discovered before. So because we saw a really interesting dynamic when we did the qualitative research is that and I'd say this is a really, I didn't pull this out, but it's a really important point. When we did our focus group research, what tended to happen was, was this. When we had a conversation with people, we would ask them, do you think you know a lot or a little about um, Northern Ireland's tourism offering? OK. And then most of the times people would say, yeah, we know quite a bit. We know a lot. OK. But the truth of it was. They knew what they knew well. But there was whole swathes of other places and experience they knew, knew, nothing, knew nothing about. So what happened in the research was someone would say, oh, yeah, I always go to this place. And someone else would go, I've never heard of that. And tell me more about it. And they'd be writing, they'd almost be writing notes. Tell me more, tell me more. So I would say any if we if we make the assumption that residents in within or the domestic market knows a lot about the domestic market, I'd say that's a faulty assumption. They know what they know. But there's lots that they don't know. And if you go back and look at the familiarity with Fermanagh Lakelands and County Drone, the Sparrens, that is, you know, there's real opportunity or room to maneuver there in terms of driving knowledge and awareness. So, so, so that's something to zone in on, I'd say. Super. Thank you, Connor. I hope that answers your question, Cormac. Um, I think it does. And 
um, it, it's good to know that it's uh, not, you know, that we're moving past that stage and, and things and that uh, people are, are free to come here. Um, just a couple of things I would pick up, uh, just I suppose even to share with people in terms of uh, other supports available. Obviously, you mentioned around this post, well, we're still living in the COVID world, but um, as we move, you know, towards uh, hopefully at some point coming out of it, but that the work we're good to go is still very much um, a sense of reassurance for people choosing um, where they go. So mm -hmm. I know a lot of the businesses across our district have actually adopted the we're good to go um, ethos, but I suppose for any of you who have um, there obviously is still an opportunity to do that and um, obviously we have information available or T and I have information available so if any of you want you know please contact us and we can help you um, get that set up for yourselves because it is one of the things that people are still um, very much keen to see adopted by premises and activity providers and everyone so um, I would just reiterate that point um, Connor. Mm -hmm. okay. and the the other thing that I wanted to say around was um, you mentioned also in terms of meeting this market. And I know obviously there's going to be another session specifically around developing experiences uh, for the domestic market. Um, but you talked a lot about collaboration and um, specifically we actually have separate to this. There's a, a webinar on Friday and it's a virtual Farm Trip Friday webinar, folks. Um, I'm sure some of you are aware of it or some of it, but again, the whole um, the whole thinking behind that is about knowing the other product, the other offering um, that is within the district and potentially where there's opportunities for you to work with other providers in the district to develop these experiences for the visitor. Um, so if you, again, if you haven't registered, you know, there's maybe an opportunity just to register for that and, you know, pick up on some of the things that the Connor mentioned today. Um, so that, sorry, there are just two things that I wanted to, to pick up on. Um, I'm not sure. Is there any other questions? I don't see any coming up in the chat box uh, there. No, there's no more. I think it's Anne, Anne is, um, I can see Anne waving. So it turns Anne, can we unmute Anne? She has a question. Uh, yeah. Sarah um, has the power of muting and unmute. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, Anne should be able to unmute herself now. You can do it yourself, Anne. Yes. Okay. Yes, there we go. Okay. Sorry, I was mid typing. Um, <laughs> I work for experience in a skill and in a skill and bid. Um, one thing through one run is the gift card. And I'm very keen to see can we use the gift card as a package, i.e., this costs £350. You buy a gift card, you get two nights accommodation, a food and drink tour, and a meal in a local restaurant. Do you think people would buy that as one complete package or will they still look to book accommodation separately, the, a drink tour separately and somewhere to eat out? Um, it's, it's hard to know um, specifically. I think what we could say with some level of confidence is, is that, and it's <laughs> obvious to say, the more that that proposition is telling better. Yeah. Like someone, sorry, someone just, chatting beside me, sorry. Oh, I know. The more that the more I think the more that, that proposition is wrapped and packed into a compelling itinerary and holistic experience, the better. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think the thing is here, what I'd say, and I, I'm only kind of speculating with you now, because I can't say this definitively. But the more that that promise or offer is built in a way that people can't do it themselves, the better. So if you offer me something for 350 quid and I feel like I can get X, Y and Z and I can put that together myself and maybe get as much, if not more value in doing that, then I'm not going to buy it. OK, mm -hmm. but if you have within that offer, whether it be adjacent experiences or attractions or things that I don't think I can find or access myself, the more you wrap that together mm -hmm. and it feels like it's unique and bespoke and special, yeah. then that premium or that price point becomes completely credible to me because it's like I can't do this, that this is this is this is put together and I can only avail and it's brilliant and it looks like good value for money, but it's all done for me and I couldn't do it myself. But if you just have 
if they see that if they can go online and say there's three components here there's one attraction two nights of accommodation and one meal and i can go on and i can just go to www book 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 what value are you really adding you know mm -hmm. so i think the more that you can provide a unique kind of is i would say tailored or feels like it's tailored um like you're almost the editor for a person mm -hmm. uh it, it, it the more salience it, i always think it's a good analogy to think about why do you buy a newspaper okay you buy a newspaper because it the editor has determined the kind of content that you're interested in so, and it's written in a way that's appealing to you so i think when you're putting together a proposition like that you're kind of thinking about your segment and saying what is it they want what have we put together here that we that, that is based on an insight and understanding of what they want that will portray to them that they'll find irresistible. So yeah, I think you've got to challenge yourself to say be segment or con and it's about just putting the component parts how they come together and there's a sense of synergy that all the parts are actually greater than the whole. Okay. So it's just that it's that bit. Okay. So, so for example, yeah. then um, with a family, if we had a local person that did um, that did uh, bushcraft and taught kids how to make tents and or out of sticks or something. Yeah, that's. I mean, to my mind, that's the exact sort of stuff that's okay. important. I mean, again, if I I, I don't I should personalize it, but when we did that trip to Dingle, we went to see a couple of the beehive huts, and actually the whole, and it just was serendipity that the 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 experience wasn't that for the for for us and the experience wasn't the beehive hut. It was the meeting the farmer who led us onto the land and told us about them. That was priceless. Yeah. So it's just that. So that example of engaging with someone that you would never have had that experience before, that creates real value. That's where I think people are willing to step up and pay for things personally. Okay, okay. great. Thank you. Uh, I see Martin has his um, hand up there. So Martin, if Tara, can you allow Martin to... Oh, Martin, you, can, <laughs> you can unmute yourself. Well, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for coming. That was really useful. Thanks for the presentation. And uh, I know maybe I'm a bit biased because I know you're using a lot of a lot of our content, but it's just great to see it um, presented in that, in that way. Um, and especially, I think at the moment, particularly with the the COVID sentiment aspect as well, because I know there's a kind of almost like a, a before and after um, aspect to what you were presenting there, which is which is good. Um, what I was just going to come in briefly on the back, it was more of a comment than maybe an update is, and I think it's already been um, it's already been highlighted in the presentation, for example, with the natural quality seekers um, and what you've already touched upon, uh, Connor, in terms of the um, the focus groups that you were doing is that people uh, domestically and, and to, uh, to a greater extent, actually, in the ROI, I know sometimes when we talk about domestic, it is Northern Ireland, but we often think of it domestic as the old Ireland uh, aspect as well, is that um, uh, our our home residents or domestic visitors do think they know Northern Ireland quite well from a tourism perspective. When you dig a little deeper, as you say, they miss whole swathes of the product and whole hidden gems and things mm -hmm. that, that they could really enjoy. I think that's where, the, to my mind, the importance of the itinerary planning comes in and actually the itinerary, itinerary exposure. So on our website, sometimes we're often focused on a side way. I know it's a, we're a tourist board, so we're not selling anything directly, but we're, uh, as an industry, we're often focused on our hotel, our self-catering, our glamping site, our activity, our event. But we forget about, I think, the visitor in terms of the wraparound and that they want to, as well as visiting that event or, or staying in that accommodation, they want to go beyond that. What else can they do? And I think by actually presenting that on your website in a kind of a selfless, selfless way, but also uh, saying, have you thought about doing this? Here's a program of activity over a couple of days. Here's what I suggest that it gives them a menu for for selecting things to do and often um one of the big uh, uh interesting facts that we found with visitor information centers and often we would have thought at this stage with the web with apps with digital technology that visitor information centers would become a thing of the past but actually i think they become even more important because people will often go in want that local knowledge that local recommendation and what our evidence and research is finding is that often when people come out of a tourist office, such as the one, say, in Enniskill and Castle or Noma, that they'll actually visit one or two other attractions or activities that they haven't originally thought of doing while they're in the area. So that's really important. That's an example, really, of, of presenting an itinerary which you're doing through the Travel Advisor. But I think through social media, through um, web platforms, through your own marketing collateral, um, there's a really good opportunity to be able to say, have you thought about this lesser known nearby 
uh, attraction uh, activity center, uh, this half day horse trekking experience is near here and getting into a sort of a, maybe not a formal partnership with them because I think that's where we can get tied up with the whole EU package legislation, which can be a wee bit tricky to circumvent. But at least if we're at least suggesting those things, it helps the sellability, I think, of that individual product and also of, the, of your partners. So you, you can get into that informal relationship with them. And also it just really, it takes the thinking out of, um, uh, out of what you're doing because I know the family segment they want to research to the nth degree but if you can give them more information and more suggestions it makes their research easier yeah yeah it, 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 it's funny I mean Martin I just build on that I mean in our world when we work in other industries one of the most uh, one of the most powerful things from a marketing communications point of view is, is you know case studies you know and you don't we don't do case studies in tourism like for consumers because it just doesn't feel right but that's really in some ways what an itinerary is you know it's it's here's a person like you and look at the amazing time that they've had so you know we fully you know i fully could say that the work is borne out the importance of that is huge in terms of giving people a sense or direction of what their days their nights their weekends can be like um and what what, what they can enjoy and the other thing as well is is that it's a slide aside, and this has actually came through in, and it may not be as much the case anymore, but I think it's important to say, this came through when we did the ROI work a couple of years ago. Um, as part of the work, we talked to, to get a perspective on things, we talked to a number of international um, tour operators about Northern Ireland, and they had a lot of good things to say. But one of the things they said is, is that from an industry point of view, there can be some kind of tendency to get the visitor and try and hold them hold them as closely as they can yeah and try and keep them and not let them out you know and is it actually you're much better served to your piece whereby if you get the visitor you know give them a good experience but don't be afraid to, afraid to send them out into locality don't be afraid to send them to a different cafe or a different experience because actually they gain value for that and you as an operator are held in higher regard and esteem as a consequence of that and it kind of raises all the ships so again that's just kind of a consideration around about that kind of idea of the itinerary goes beyond me and it's really about my area and the best that it, c it can be. Um, because that's ultimately putting the visitor, or the consumer, or the customer first. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Thanks, Connor. Thanks, Connor. Um, we have another question in from Anita. I'm not sure that anyone will be able to answer it here, but if not, Anita, I will um, certainly take it and come back to you. Um, it's just asking around, is there any advice to operators and how they proceed in terms of cancellations for bookings? Um, so, um, not sure if anyone, Martin, could you have a response on uh, that? I, but I, just, I just come in, Karen, that briefly. Yeah. I don't have the answer because I'm, right. I'm not close enough to the, to the uh, legislation and all of the yeah. um, policies. And to be honest, they are changing on a regular basis. What I will say, and I'll put up on the chat, if um, we still have our um, helpline open uh, nine to five Monday to Friday, uh, we have our team of, uh, and our, our team is building up this intelligence expertise knowledge on a pretty much daily basis at this point. So um, if I can ask the number who it was, sorry, to um, to call that number, I'll give an email address as well. But it's easy, it's easy just to give give one of the team a call and say they're open nine to five Monday to Friday. They uh, if they again if they don't have it at their fingertips, they'll certainly try and find out for you and either or phone you or email you back. Brilliant, thanks, Martin. Okay. Um, and I'm sure you can all see that there. Louise has just um updated that uh, from Adelaide Land Tourism have recently updated their itineraries, uh, which they're happy to share with the trade and they can use to build their own ideas. So the link's there as well. Um, so familiarise yourself with those for sure. Um, if there's any more questions, keep them coming. But in the meantime, I think um, it would be good to have a bit of a chat around the the dates for the next um, two in this domestic market series. Um, as I said, two follow up sessions. One will cover um, how to develop experiences and these itineraries that we're talking about um, in order to you know for the domestic market and. Um, as Connor said throughout the presentation, if you get it right for the domestic market, it will then, um, when the, the international markets reopen, you will already be in a good stead because it, it's kind of a, if the if the locals are happy with it, the international visitors should, you know, be happy with it as well. So um, 
in that, and then there will be a session on um, marketing and communicating with the domestic market. Um, so again, as I said, look, um, we, we want to work this around you folks because we're doing this for you and it's for you to get the most out of it. Um, but we're also conscious of the position that people are in, reopening dates and all of that. So um, we want to make sure that it's a time that suits you. I don't know if you want to, you know, if anyone wants to contribute in the chat about, um, you know, is, is in the next two weeks too soon? Would you rather have it wrapped up before Christmas? Um, I suppose any of this really, if we're talking about developing experiences and we're talking about marketing to the domestic market, we are talking, obviously, this is a long term game too, but in the near future, it's going to be very important. So the sooner we can relay this information, the better. But obviously, it has to be when suits you. So, um, there's, yeah, so um, does this, I suppose there's a couple of things, the questions, uh, is, does this time suit? Um, <laughs> okay, so everyone wants to do <laughs> that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, so if we say, <laughs> okay, before Christmas break, yes, okay. Um, so if we, um, <laughs> pull the chat there, great, uh, 2 p.m. fine and before Christmas. So if we go with that, if we throw out a couple of, um, dates, um, we'll, we'll get a couple of dates in for, um, Christmas and cover both topics off. Um, and if the date we throw out seem, if it conflicts with anything that is happening in terms of restrictions lifting guidelines we'll, we'll revisit it but we'll make sure that we get the two sessions in before Christmas if um, that seems to be the general consensus so that's great. Um, folks if there's no more questions coming through I think we can just thank um, Connor for his time and um, very good in-depth um, presentation and uh, thank you very much for that. Martin thank you for joining us great to have your input as well and um, folks as I say we will um, send out the presentation to you so you have it um, and if there's anything else you need, plus you have our contact details, so feel free to just get in touch. Thanks very much, folks. Okay, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Connor. Have thanks, good Karen. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Karen. Yes, Connor. Do you want to, if we let the guys go, do you want to stay in the call? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's 100%. Yeah. Okay. Karen, okay. do you want to stop recording there? I will, yeah.